so my name is Tim Middleton. I uh, work at uh, BookNet Canada. And I know many of you are here thanks to the cool title that Lauren came up with for my talk this year. But really what this is about is astrological science. So um, I'm a Gemini. And uh, Gemini can be thought of as a generalist because they have more than one personality. There isn't a ton of room for generalists in uh, our brave new world of technology, but we're still around. And we find fascinating things like the transition from film stock to digital, because what that is is both a technology issue and a business issue, not to mention the implied impact of this transition on art, culture, and society as a whole. At BookNet, BookNet, many of us get to wear a few hats from day to day, and two of mine are as a retail liaison, where I get to stay in touch with my roots as a bookseller, and another is as a project manager for our metadata aggregation platform, BiblioShare. Both require me to stay abreast of change in pretty different ways. Again, good for Gemini. On the retail side, I have to know what is happening in the market. What things are retailers doing? How is bricks and mortar doing in the face of all the challenges? What things are retailers doing both offline and online? And what technologies that seemed like sci-fi not long ago are they now embracing? 3D printing, so normal you see mechanics or you see machines at practically every public library, not to mention how ubiquitous print-on-demand has become in just a few years. Of course, not all retailers care about changing, and certainly not all retailers can make changes on such a huge scale. Some don't even do e-commerce yet. So as many of you know and have seen, we also do less dramatic, more focused research, and this is some of us, some of our research that we hope retailers will find helpful. And there's that uh, binary screen that Noah was talking about that uh, you shouldn't include in your presentations, but I did. And on the project management side, I get to try to stay familiar with standards and technology. So I get to think about platforms. I think about patterns, uh, frameworks, and design. When Lauren proposed the topic spiders, chatbots, and the future of metadata, a look inside the BNC BiblioShare sandbox, I thought, sure, why not? I love technology, I love the future, and I do love sandboxes. As I thought more on the topic, particularly the future part of this talk, I was compelled to reflect on my history with technology. I didn't always love technology. In university, I avoided it. At my job as an independent bookseller, I hated it. But then my Gemini nature kicked in, and I started to think of myself as an early adopter. I started using Firefox and Gmail in 2004, Chrome in 2008. I was blogging when blogging wasn't called blogging. I have joined Facebook as soon as it became available to the general public, Twitter likewise, and over and over again, I jumped on the latest thing. My resistance was down, and like everyone else, I was swept up in the shifting sands of change of the digital age. And as my work changed, I began following the trends and development of web technologies. I read about decoupling presentation layers from business logic layers. I read about CSS. I read about JavaScript. And I believed in the Ajax manifesto. I played with XML, ASP.NET, Apache, Linux servers, MySQL, SQLite, the endless barrage of technologies that the internet has loosed upon the world. I followed the back and forth debates about open source versus proprietary software, object-oriented programming versus procedural programming, dynamically typed versus statically typed languages. Design patterns were my go-to geek reads, and wall gardens were built for climbing over. And this is where some of you may be thinking, well, he didn't mention Web 2.0, HTML5, Ruby on Rails, React, Node.js, Nginx, Hadoop, Clusters, Semantic Web, Compilers, Parsers, Agile, Waterfall, and well, you get the picture. There have been so many new technologies over the last 20 years or so that if you keep listing them all, your slide ends up looking like a black hole. But then maybe something really evolutionary emerges from that black hole, and we're all moved forward. The technological changes have led to social change. We have seen the org chart catch up to the new reality. And the next closest thing to robots, engineers, are taking over. 
People have now become back-end developers, front-end developers, JavaScript experts, this language or that language proficient, not to mention the much sought after full stack developer. As I remembered my past, I thought perhaps this talk should be called the ups and downs of an early adopter, the ins and outs of an English major in technology, or perhaps running to keep up. But it isn't. It's called spiders, chatbots, and the future metadata. But while I was reflecting on my past to gain a foothold on the future, a truly horrible realization came upon me. The experience I had was akin to an automobile moment. It was a mouse moment. It was an existential crisis. Snapchat was born. And just like that, I was no longer what I thought of as an early adopter. Snapchat broke me. <laughs> I tried it, and I found it confounding. What was this thing? How horrible the UI. It was time for me to retire, I thought. Time to retire from following all the trends, retire from early adoption disorder. Stop changing with the times, Snapchat. I read articles about it. My kids used it like crazy. But as the hysteria died down, and I realized I wasn't the only one who maybe didn't get Snapchat, a moment of clarity helped me to see that Snapchat is just our new iteration of the camera. So you could say Snapchat is having its Kodak moment. That might help. I still don't use Snapchat. The last I tried, my own child blocked me, and I was cut to the quick. <laughs> no more of this cruel new social media hooked up camera, I cried. The point is, I understand how the publishing industry feels about these trying times. I understand it is tiring, but at the same time exhilarating to be dealing with change. Publishing may have made its Kodak, had its Kodak moment hundreds of years ago, but that doesn't mean we have to stop smiling. Now, after that long-winded explanation of my very real struggle with the future, let me talk about BiblioShare. Thinking about BiblioShare, I was once again transported backwards. I was reminded of a project that preceded BiblioShare and was loved by all at BookNet, Book Monitor. But sadly, BNC Book Monitor never got to see the light of day. The idea behind Book Monitor was that it would allow publishers and distributors to keep track of how their titles appeared on major online bookseller sites and databases. The time, really not that long ago, did not allow this wonderful tool to succeed. Crawling websites was treated as a problem rather than an opportunity. But another reason this project was shelved and is the same problem we all come up against in our businesses is resources. And that problem, and that problem is the problem of resources. This was brought home to me recently when a few of us on the BiblioShare team sat down and talked about building an AI for Onyx. We thought it would be simple to have a developer learn all about metadata, meta machine learning, and then train our AI on the Onyx manual and our Onyx database. It was really a glorified support robot, but that's what you think about when you're in the technology business. Let's build robots. But our developer eloquently put our dewy-eyed fantasy to rest when he said, we aren't Google, and I had to agree. We also aren't Facebook or Amazon or Netflix. The uh, struggle for resources is real, people. Another issue we often come up against is, does anyone care? For instance, after being knocked down an AI notch, we thought, what about a Twitter bot? Surely the resources to create that wouldn't be as demanding. So here I'll do an informal survey. Please put your hand up if you would follow or find interesting tweets like, hey, BiblioShare has 96,000 Canadian authored records. Did you know there are close to 2.5 million records in BiblioShare? And other. <laughs> okay, this was a cheap trick to get BiblioShare stats into my presentation, but we did think about a Twitter bot. And if you think something like a BiblioBot is vital for the industry, let us know. You can tell us privately, offline, and we will never let your secret out. So when we start thinking about the possibilities of a database full of wonderful metadata and the technologies that can be leveraged to turn that data into something equally wonderful and imminently useful, we think resources and industry need. As a publisher in the digital age, really? 
there aren't enough hours in the day that you can spend thinking about metadata. Metadata is not a new concept by any means, but the importance of it has never been greater than now. Metadata helps keep track, inform, and assist discovery. BiblioShare helps us think about and act upon the needs of metadata. BiblioShare lets us see, is the metadata accurate? Is it credible? What's the source? Is it machine or people? It's a lot of effort. Do we have enough people and time? We hope BiblioShare helps us answer the right questions. We hope. But at its root, BookNet, the industry, and presumably consumers are less without the metadata for a title. That book we don't have the metadata for in BiblioShare looks like a cool book. And we want all of the data we can get in BiblioShare. None of our external partners using BiblioShare data wants to experience this message when they're searching for a title. We don't like to see this when we query our Onyx web service for this title. So for the future, more data, please. In response to wanting more data, we have started requesting and accepting samples for ingestion into and delivery from BiblioShare. We're requesting this now because industry partners have asked for it, and partly because we know from our consumer survey data that samples help consumers with their buying decisions. We ask consumers who bought the book through these channels what influenced your decision to buy the book. We included choices like it contained information needed, description of the book, front cover caught attention, appealed, won, been nominated for book prize. And it's not surprising that 38% of consumers who purchased their book online said they read a sample or an excerpt before deciding to buy that book. For consumers of fiction, 8.4% of them said they had downloaded a sample before buying. And when we drilled into the data, we started seeing which genres get a boost when a sample is downloaded. Nonfiction consumers are a little less likely to need a sample to influence their purchase. But if you publish books on mathematics, know this, they love their samples. We currently are accepting both EPUB and PDF formats for samples, and we'll also accept table of contents as well as reader's guides. Our obvious user for samples will certainly be Catalyst and possibly 49th Shelf, but we're making a bet that down the road, lots of people will find this service valuable. The last thing I want to talk about is what we built instead of a robot. Bibliomatic. Bibliomatic is a Google Chrome extension. If there's enough demand, there's no reason we wouldn't build a Firefox add-on as well, but Chrome is a good way to measure the usefulness of this, and this is how we push the industry forward. The data we pull from BiblioShare for Bibliomatic, when available, is title, contributor, product form, pub date, subject, keywords, audience, and list price. Oh, and of course, any cover, interior, or author images that are associated with the ISBN. When Bibliomatic finds a valid ISBN on a web page, it provides an icon next to the identifier. When you click on the icon, a pop-up appears. That contains, the basic, that contains the basic bibliographic data, along with links to the title detail page and sales data, or Catalyst, so you can check them there. And you can see the Onyx output that is getting distributed through BNC BiblioShare by clicking the View Onyx record link. So that's going to be the raw data from our output. Another cool thing about the Chrome extension is that if you're using Gmail, it will detect ISBNs in your email as well. So now if you are the recipient of our processing report from BiblioShare and say you want to know if your title is in Catalyst yet, with your BiblioShare processing report open, you click that icon and if the pop-up box has data displayed, then you know it's in our outbound and ready for Catalyst to import. Now click on the Catalyst link to see if the title is in Catalyst yet. We take you to the title detail page in Catalyst, but notice that cover. Why is that cover not updated in Catalyst yet, you wonder? You log into Catalyst, click the edit this record, and lo and behold, realize you have the cover image locked. Click the unlock and let our cover service take care of updating your cover image. Granted, it isn't as spectacular as a robot, but we think it is clearly useful for the industry, especially for the users of our services. We will continue to romp in the playground that metadata makes, and perhaps one day when the stars align, we'll befriend a robot in the sandbox. Thank you very much. <laughs>